Students gather behind the door of their sword-fighting dojo. An intruder has arrived, announcing that he's come to defeat every swordsman there. As the children worry about what they're going to do, an older girl assures them that there's nothing to be afraid of. After all, the man is against their reliable teacher, Beryl Gardner. As the two face off with wooden swords, the intruder makes the first move and lets out a big downward slash. However, his hopes of taking over the dojo are completely crushed, as the sensei smoothly dodges the attack and swiftly strikes through his opponent's neck. With this, the man loses consciousness and is promptly defeated. The older girl from earlier looks on in awe and amazement, unable to fathom the overwhelming swordsmanship of his master. The kingdom of Lebris is a monarchical state. In this country of notorious knights and adventurers, a strange rumor floats around the population. Apparently, most of the great heroes who etched their names in history had the same man as their master. He also carried the title of backwater swordmaster. A couple of horses continue their journey, carrying a heavy carriage through a rural area in the kingdom. The coachman thanks his passenger for her patience and informs her that they've almost arrived at their destination. Thanking him, she looks out the window with a heavy sense of nostalgia. An old man peeks into a training room and sees his son, Beryl, dutifully practicing at such an ungodly hour. Frustrated by the sight, he pleads with the younger man and asks him to at least give him a grandchild before his death. He pauses his training in size, wondering if he isn't already a good son. After all, the number of students they have increased right after he took over their dojo. Not wanting to give in, his father insists that he isn't quite there yet, then asks if there are any girls he likes among his pupils. Beryl scolds him, as the dojo is no place for flirting. Besides, who would want to marry into the backwater dojo family anyway? Every swordsman there is aiming at becoming a knight or an adventurer. After having been in touch with the sword ever since he was a toddler, he also had the same goal. With bright young eyes, he dreamed that he'd go to town one day and save several people with his blade. Unfortunately, due to his poor physical stature, he could only become a teacher for basic sword self-defense at a dojo in the middle of nowhere. Thinking about his father's words, he waves his wooden sword around and remembers an apprentice from before who insisted on becoming his wife when she grew up. His thoughts and training session are interrupted as a woman enters the room and excuses herself for the intrusion. Looking at her, he recognizes her as Alusha, the pupil he was just thinking about. It's been years and she looks so grown up that he almost couldn't recognize her. On the other hand, he hasn't changed at all. After training with him for a few years, she joined the Liberia Knights and eventually made her way up the ranks to become the head of the Royal Knights. During their time together, it was already obvious that she had a natural talent. By just watching and mimicking his moves, the young girl was able to learn so much from her master. After four years passed, there was nothing left for him to teach his pupil. When she left the dojo, he gave her a sword as a parting gift. Honestly speaking, she could get a much better weapon in the city, but for some reason, she prefers to use that particular one. Finally getting down to business, he asks for the purpose of her visit. Alusha shares that, aside from her responsibilities as the head of the knights, she's also tasked with instructing their men in fencing. As the instructor, she's tasked with guiding and training all the knights in the knight order. In other words, the instructor of the knights is basically the best swordsman in the entire kingdom. He expresses his pride in her, not expecting that any of his students would go so far in life. To his surprise, she suddenly reveals that she recommended him for the position of their special instructor. Moreover, everyone she spoke to accepted the recommendation with no objection whatsoever. In other words, the Liberian Knights would like to have him as their instructor. The unexpected request stuns him, and it takes a while for the idea to register properly in his mind. Why would he be offered a position taken up by only the best swordsmen in the kingdom? She says that there's a carriage waiting for them outside and that he needs to come with them to the capital. After all, they will be making a lot of adjustments to the current training program. He tries to protest, arguing that everything is happening way too suddenly. However, she takes out a piece of paper and shows it to him. It's an imperial decree with the royal seal, indicating that it's an order he cannot refuse. With no choice but to accept, he makes his way up the carriage, still filled with doubts. In the kingdom capital, Valtrain is the official garrison of the Liberium Knights. With every single knight in front of them, Alusha introduces Beryl, announcing his position as their special instructor, and adding that she expects them to exceed all of her expectations. Meanwhile, the man himself finds it all amazing. Right now, there's over a hundred people in front of him, and just from their posture alone, he's certain that they're all very skilled. All of a sudden, the head of the knights asserts that their new instructor far surpasses her in terms of skill, and tells everyone to submit their applications accordingly. 
With this, she asks him to take the stage and say a few words to his new students. Surprised, he sheepishly introduces himself, still unable to recover from the consistent flattery. With his unkempt behavior apparent, people begin to chatter, and a person from the crowd stares at him intently. Back in the carriage, Alusha says that he only needs to visit and teach a few times a month, as he already has plenty of students under his wing. That being said, he believes that the knights from earlier don't even need any kind of instruction from him. The two make their way to the middle of town to buy souvenirs. As he apologizes for dragging his former student with him, she simply points around, suggesting various things to buy. While walking around, Beryl notices that they're drawing a lot of attention. After all, the head of the Royal Knights is casually going about with a middle-aged man. Misunderstanding his words, she turns away and gets shy, wondering if their little trip could be considered a date. Just then, a strong and rugged-looking woman approaches them from behind. She insists that it's pathetic to see the head of the Royal Knights out shopping with a man, not paying her much attention. Alusha dismissingly asks what she wants, obviously wanting her to leave right away. Meanwhile, Beryl has no idea who she is. He notices the plate on her necklace, indicating that she's a black adventurer from the guild, one of the strongest among all adventurers. For some reason, the arrogant-sounding woman is stunned and can only stare at him. She suddenly comes up to him and urgently grips his shoulders, recognizing her old teacher. With a closer look, he finally sees the familiar face of Selina. With her snarky expression replaced with a beaming and soft one, she holds him tight, glad that her old master remembers her, even though decades have already passed. About 20 years ago, he found the child as an orphan and decided to take her into their dojo. There, he taught her swordsmanship for three years and sent her off to be adopted by a proper family. Their fateful reunion is interrupted as Alusha gets a menacing aura around her. She tells the adventurer to let go of their teacher, since he's quite busy at the moment. Caught in the middle of the clashing personalities, Beryl has no choice but to walk with them. Selina invites him over to her guild and offers to show him around. Before he could even answer, the head of the knights butted in, insisting that it's her who's going to show him around. Due to the constant arguing, people begin to watch and wonder why two prominent women are with a random old guy. The group finally enters a blacksmith's shop, and the two women are brightly greeted by the store owner, who says he had a fine batch of steel arrive recently. Everywhere they go, people either gossip or show them respect. His students have truly grown up to become great women. He looks around the forge and picks up a sword, noting that they have some pretty good swords. Noticing his interest, the owner tells him to give it a try and ushers him over to the cutting target. Meanwhile, the two ladies who have finally stopped bickering watch calmly from behind as it's been a while since they saw him using a sword. He gets flustered upon hearing their words. Even with a sharp blade, strength is still needed to cut through small things like a fish's spine. The tatami amon, developed in the east, has a similar resistance to that of a human body. Most of the time, blades not only fail to cut through, but there's also a possibility of them bending. Moreover, his day had been pretty tiresome with all the surprises. With this, he grips the hilt with both hands and raises the blade above his head. With calm eyes, Beryl convinces himself that the blade is fine and that he simply has to concentrate properly. With one swift motion, he slashes sideways and cuts right through the target. His students look on, satisfied with the perfect display of swordsmanship. He's as sharp as always. Meanwhile, the store owner has his eyes fixed on the target, pointing out that it's still standing tall, despite being cut by the blade. At the end of the day, they leave the store without buying anything. He didn't bring much money anyway, so there wasn't really much to buy with. As they're leaving, Selena whispers to Alusha, discreetly mentioning something about the sword used earlier. Before she could complete the thought, the head of the knight said that she noticed as well, and added that an apprentice probably mixed the blades up. Just then, the store owner realizes something while looking at the sword. He rushes into the smithing room and scolds his men for releasing an unfinished and blunt sword for sale. While looking at the dull blade, he looks at the tatami target, perfectly cut in half. Despite the years that have passed, the backwater sword master seems to still be in form. On their way back from the capital, Beryl looks out to the open field. Being assigned as the instructor of the knightly order might be a biased decision on Alusha's part. However, it's certainly a huge step forward in his career. Knowing this, he doubts the legitimacy of his role. With what's happening, he believes that they're basically fooling the knights. If he were to mess up, then the mistake would drag her down with him. Perplexed with the turn of events, he decides to figure it out when he gets home. He was expecting to end his hectic day peacefully, but upon entering his house, he's immediately called out by his father, who forbids him from returning home for a while. On his knees, the man is completely caught off guard. Back in the capital, 
Beryl is face to face with Alusha, who's shocked to find that he's been kicked out of his own home. She asks what happened, and he retells his story from the previous night. After his long day, he was greeted by his father in Landry, an old student who became an adventurer, glad to see his master doing well. The younger man shares that he recently had a child and took it as a sign to retire from his dangerous occupation. While he's proud of his student, Beryl gets slightly bitter to see someone younger than him get married first. He asks what he plans to do after retiring, but his father cuts into their conversation. To his surprise, the old man reveals that he's put Landry in charge of the dojo, all without consulting him. With this, he has no choice but to return Valtrain and fulfill his duty. Before he could grasp what was happening, his father added on to the lecturing and told him to find himself a wife while he's out. Hearing this, Alusha sees an opportunity and can't help but delight in the convenient situation. Still troubled, Beryl says he has to find a place to stay first. He was about to ask for help finding an inn, but she interrupts and offers him her own place, an idea he sternly rejects. As such, they make their way to the Adventurer's Guild, an understandably lively establishment. Since he's looking for a place to stay, the guild might be the best source of information. After all, travelers come and go there all the time. Suddenly, a familiar face pops up. Selena, looking particularly disheveled, looks at him in surprise. In a futile attempt to tidy herself up, she brushes her hair with her hands and asks why he's returned so soon. He explains the situation and asks for her help. Knowing a few cheap places he could go to, she takes out a map and points to some options. The adventurer suggests a place near the guild at first, but the head of the knights interrupts. Since he'll have to frequent the barracks from then on, she argues that a place closer to her own house would be the most practical choice. Seeing right through her plan, Selena outright asks if she's planning to use the unfortunate situation to fuel her selfish desires. Alusha sends the questions right back at her. The tension grows stronger, making the floor below them shake. The two face off, hovering their hands over their weapons. They can already see it, the swift swing of their swords aimed at each other's body. However, there's something else they see. The instant they move to strike is also the instant they lose their weapons, confiscated by their master before they could even react. Knowing this, the two ladies calm down and stay still, leaving Beryl completely confused. They settle the matter as a draw, agreeing that their master would just stop them anyway. Either way, he's relieved that nothing happened. For a moment, he really thought that they'd draw their blades. A while later, he's shown to his room, and the innkeeper asks him to send his best regards to Selena. All things considered, the place is pretty good. It's a little far from the barracks and the guild, but the market and blacksmith are nearby. Alusha looked grumpy with the final decision, but it's thanks to both of them that he was able to find such a nice place to stay. He chugs on some alcohol later on and slams the mug on the table, annoyed by how disgraceful he's been lately. Both the instructor position and his current lodging were handed to him on a silver plate. Right now, he's just some old man who's being coddled by his past students. He buries his head down, wondering what Alusha expects from him. The next day, he makes his way to the barracks, where the head of the knights asks about his troubles. Waving it off, they eventually arrive at the training hall for the knights. In there, a bunch of men are equipped with wooden swords and are engaging in some type of sparring. One person in particular is moving seamlessly while pressuring his opponent. With a powerful rotational attack, he slices the other knight's sword in half and immediately asks for the next sparring partner. In the hall, everyone practices their movements and simulates battles. As Beryl is worrying about them killing each other, Alusha calls for everyone's attention. She announces that they will be advancing their schedule, and that from then on, their new instructor will be taking over their lessons. The others chatter. They don't mean to doubt her recommendation, but it's only natural. It's true that he taught her as a child, but they question if there really is anything to learn from the middle-aged man. Their vicious stares bore holes right through him. As expected, he isn't exactly welcome there. Just then, the tension is broken as a small hand pops up among the crowd, and a light voice calls out to her teacher. Among the knights, a young girl delightful waves her hand, saying it's been a long time since they saw each other. Taking a closer look, he recognizes the familiar face as Kirini. She greets him with a bright smile, and he expresses his happiness to know that she's become a knight. Waving her hands in denial, she insists that there's still a long way for her to go. That being said, she's glad to be under his guidance once more, since she could only go to his dojo for a couple of years. Hearing this, his eyes are suddenly filled with tears. The two women worry about the abrupt crying, but the old man says that he's simply surprised, as his students have all grown up so well. With things settled, Alusha scolds Kirini lightly, reminding her to refrain from chatting during their training sessions. Meanwhile, 
Beryl doubts himself again. How long is he going to rely on his students? It's time to man up, even though he really is an old man. Emphasis on man. Just then, another knight approaches them and calls out to the commander. It's the rotating slasher from before. He introduces himself as Hembert Strout, the vice commander of the knightly order. Hearing his introduction, Beryl immediately realizes the situation. The young man in front of him is the one with the penetrating gaze from yesterday and the very definition of bloodlust. The vice commander speaks his mind, asserting that the Liberio are very proud of their knightly order. As such, to instruct them, an adequate level of expertise is required. Wanting to confirm Alusha's claims about the new instructor, he offers Beryl a wooden sword and challenges him to a match. With a determined gaze, he stares at the older man, who's stunned by the unexpected request. As Hembritz challenges Beryl in a duel, Alusha sees that it is finally time for her sensei to be in the limelight, known for his great swordsmanship in front of the knightly order. It is explained that the Liberio Knights are a knightly order renowned for being the strongest in any of the kingdoms of the world. It is an order so exclusive that only a handful of the finest warriors are chosen to come within its ranks, all of whom undergo the strictest of training. It is strongly believed that a single Liberio Knight is enough to match ten strong knights from other kingdoms. Now in front of Beryl is Vice Commander Hembritz, challenging him to a duel. Even among the Liberio Knights, he is among the best of the best, second only to Alusha. The middle-aged sensei cannot grasp how awkward the situation has become for him. He wants to refuse the match but knows that if he does so, everyone will doubt his caliber as an instructor. On the other hand, he doubts his own skill in combat and fears being exposed as a fraud and being kicked out if he gets humiliated. The worst-case scenario he fears is that Alusha's credibility and job as commander are also on the line if he does not perform sufficiently in the match. Contrary to his worries, Alusha shows her excitement at the opportunity that the knights will see his skills as a great swordsman, something that makes him even more pressured. The duel is about to begin as Beryl and Hembritz face each other with wooden swords in hand and a crowd of knights as an audience. While the knights are looking on and talking about what will happen, the middle-aged man is getting agitated, knowing there is no way to back out now. As Kirini observes, she is nervous since this is the first time she is going to see her sensei in a face-off. She goes on about how the vice commander has inhuman strength. He is, after all, a man who can eliminate a raging bull with just a swing of a wooden sword, and how many have broken their arms just by blocking his sword attacks. Alusha comforts the worried girl and tells her to just watch closely. Meanwhile, Hembritz is thinking about the situation. He contemplates how thrilled he was when he first heard that the commander herself had appointed an instructor, the rumored backwater sword master at that. However, once he saw Beryl face to face, he looked nothing like what he expected. Instead, he just exuded the presence of a regular middle-aged man. Suspicion rose in the vice commander's mind. He cannot ignore the possibility that he might have made his former student recommend him as an instructor. After all, if he did so, it would be hard for Alusha to say no. He knows that there is a possibility that he might be wrong about all of this. However, the bad feeling still lingers in his mind that if he is right, then they are welcoming a manipulative maggot trying to crawl its way into their prestigious knightly order. As he contemplates this horrible thought, it makes him more serious so he takes a fighting stance. He is so intense that Beryl can sense his bloodlust against him. The sensei prepares himself for what's to come, thinking that he must not at least lose in an embarrassing way. He too, becomes serious and takes a fighting stance. The two stare at each other intensely. Aluka signals for the match to begin. In an instant, Hembritz runs toward his target like a predator circling his prey. He trusts his sword towards Beryl, creating a strong impact that is so powerful that it looks like a booming flash of light to the onlookers. The audience is on the edge from where they stand. However, the young challenger shows a face of worry. As the mist clears, it is he who is pinned to the ground, while Beryl's wooden sword corners his neck. Hembritz cannot believe what happened, and neither can the crowd of knights, who never imagined seeing the vice commander be defeated. The events happened so fast that none of the crowd could process what happened, and that included Kirini. Alusha, on the other hand, saw everything clearly. She knows that when Hembritz charged in as soon as the battle began, he went for the sensei's throat. She also knows that this was just a feint, and the real attack was a horizontal slash at Beryl's open torso. With the veteran swordsman's kin observation, he parried his sword, making the vice commander sidestep, and he lost his balance. From there, all the sensei needed to do was make a sword motion down towards the enemy's neck. All that happened in a blink of an eye. While Alusha explains everything that happened, Kirini is still left baffled and overwhelmed. Still, the battle continues as the man refuses to give up. 
Again, he goes into an offensive, leading Beryl to effortlessly block his attack and hit his chin. As Hembritz rests his face, Beryl apologizes, since he did not mean to make his attack so strong. The challenger becomes busy trying to analyze the sensei, and cannot comprehend how much the man can see his movements. Alusha is on the sidelines, admiring her from her teacher. She knows that the secret to his unparalleled strength is his observant eyes. She knows that with one gaze, her sensei has already analyzed every angle of an enemy, be it his breath, gaze, footing, center of gravity, grip, skill, and so on. Not only are his eyes formidable, but they are polished beyond the utmost limits. He might as well be an all-seeing sword. While she says this, Beryl has already landed another strike towards the enemy's abdomen. Again, the vice commander is defeated in front of a crowd that is not used to seeing him look so helpless. Hembritz begins to wonder how many times he would have died if this were a real battle with real swords. He imagines himself to be full of bleeding injuries from the multiple areas in which he was struck. Despite this, he does not give up and continues the wide swing of his sword. It turns out that this is the starting motion of his trump card finishing move, a move he is proud of since even Alusha had a hard time dealing with it. Like a ballerina, the man spins fast. Onlookers know that they are looking at the finishing move, known as the spinning slice. Beginning with a spin, he first obfuscates his hands with his back, making the real reach of the attack hard to predict. He makes the sword accelerate with his Herculean strength and centrifugal force, and in the end, he will completely shatter the enemy's defense. Yet despite the specialty of the move, he hits nothing but air, and he is hit on the head by Beryl's wooden sword from behind. He falls to the ground against an opponent who barely made an effort. Hembritz is in awe of the sensei, whom he now recognizes as the real deal. The duel makes Alusha reminisce about when it was her turn to spar with the vice commander and defeated him. Later, Hembritz told her that when they were sparring, it felt like they had different goals in mind when it came to battle. It led him to ask her why she became a knight, a question that still lingers and haunts her to this day. Back at present, Beryl has another victory against the vice commander. Again, he is pinned to the ground. The sensei's serious fighting mood is turned off when he hears that the crowd is clapping due to his performance. Alusha signals that the match has ended. Later, the knights go to a tavern. Kirini proposes a toast in celebration of their sensei Beryl's appointment as their instructor. The entire gang collides their mugs together. As if used to these kinds of gatherings, Alusha gloves down a full mug, ignorant that the man he admires most is looking at her. She eats a skewer of meat quickly and then drinks another mug of beer to a satisfying, bubbly beer mustache. Then she realizes she was in front of Beryl all along and becomes embarrassed by her she acted. She is so embarrassed that she gets annoyed that Kirini is commenting on her beer habit in front of everyone. However, middle-aged man is just happy, since he never thought there would be a time that he would share drinks with people he used to think of as children. Before he knows it, his mug is already empty. A man then offers a bottle to him, and it turns out it is Hembritz. Unlike their previous altercation, the two now act like friends. The man brings up the fact that the banquet is worth it since many guild members want to pay their respects to Beryl as a swordsman. He also apologizes for his rude challenge before, and he wants to make up for it by offering him drinks. It is not long and Hembritz is already drunk. All fired up, he stumps his mug on the table, proclaiming how impressed he is with Beryl's skills. He also says he is now ashamed of doubting him as an instructor before. Meanwhile, a number of empty mugs are already in front of Alusha, the many that have fallen victim to her drinking habit. She asks her sensei what he thinks of Hembritz's sword skills after facing him. He comments that the man is strong, with an arm strength outside of the normal human range, a compliment that makes the vice commander proud. Beryl especially wants to compliment the man's spinning attack. He argues that if he were even a second less careful, he would have taken the blow head-on, and it would have been so strong that it would have cut through his wooden sword. His comments impress Hembritz, who sees how good the sensei's analytical skills are, even during the heat of battle. Beryl continues, and he said that due to the spinning move's potency, he had no choice but to walk around it in order to dodge it. He tells him that the weak point of his rotating slash is that if one is able to get behind it, the opponent will be able to dodge his sword and get into his blind spot. He advises the man to come up with something for when he misses. The vice commander respects Beryl so much now that he bows to his advice. His humility is so out of character for the other knights that they think he must have drunk too much. With a low and humble head, Hembritz tells the sensei that he is truly needed by the knightly order and that he looks forward to his continued guidance from here on out. Beryl looks at the man and sees that even the strongest knights are insecure about the path they are headed down. Seeing his sincerity, he wants to make more effort to be a better instructor. He replies to the man that he, too, is looking forward to working together. 
Hembritz makes it known that it feels like a dream to see the so-called backwater sortmaster in front of his eyes, something that caught Beryl off guard. It is as if he has never heard anyone call him the with that name before, and he panics when asking the vice commander what he meant by that name. Later on, after the banquet, Alucia sits alone on a park bench, looking disappointed in herself. She keeps touching her braided hair, thinking about how vulgar she might have looked when drinking in front of her sensei. She thinks that she might have let her guard down since her plans are going so well. She remembers Beryl's advice on getting around Hembritz's spinning and remembers when she too was able to dodge the move before too. But unlike her sensei, it still cost her a broken practice sword. Looking at the stars, she thinks about how her teacher is still incredible to this day. When she was still a young student at his dojo, Beryl gave her a sword and said it was a parting gift to those who were able to master all his techniques. As the man told Alusha there was nothing more he could teach her, the girl protested. She argues that he was still in a different leaf from her. Beryl heard his compliment and thought she was only overrating him. He told his student that she was a natural far above him, someone so high caliber to be stuck in a dojo in the boonies. At that time, the young girl was worried for her mentor and how he thought so little of himself. On that day, as he moved on from the dojo, she told herself that her life's goal had been decided. Later on, she tried to join the knights. The officials looking at that year's candidates thought the crop of potential knights was plentiful. However, when they saw Lucia among the candidates, they expressed doubts because she was so young. It became a time when candidates needed to duel among themselves to pass the exam. Once the candidates win and are selected, they will then face the instructors in sparing. Upon facing her opponent, Alusha instantly knew that she had already won. It did not matter if it were the best of the candidates, the instructors, or the best among the knightly order. She won with no effort. She knew that no one else could match the skill of her sensei. Since her remarkable success recurred in the exam, she has established herself as a successful knight, becoming the youngest commander appointed in history. It was not long until it came the time when a superior officer asked her to be an instructor for the knights. Her superior thought that no one was more qualified than her. However, Alusha had other plans. She told her superior that there was someone even more qualified than her for the job. While all this was happening, Beryl was still at the dojo, teaching children how to hold a sword. As she recounts the days since she appointed her sensei as the instructor, she tells herself that the reason she became a knight was to prepare a stage worthy of her sensei. As she holds on to his sword, she tells herself that she does not care that her plans are over the top or what people would think of her. She does not care if she has no big ambitions like the other knights. The thought that no one would ever know about her Beryl's swordsmanship was too much to bear for her to think about anything else. Alusha's mind then goes to a memory of when she was crying under a tree for bruising a kid from another dojo during practice. She was so sad that Beryl came to comfort her about it. He told the young girl that it was just an accident. However, these words were not enough for the crying girl, who thought she had put her sensei in a bad position. He sat beside her at the tree and offered her a handkerchief. He told the girl that he was just glad she was not hurt. He told her that while it was still not good that the kid from the other dojo got hurt, he could not help but worry about his own pupils more. He continued on to say that as long as she was not hurt, nothing could ever bother him. The crying girl was so touched by his words that she hugged her teacher without warning. All the adult Alusha could remember was her sensei's smile at that frozen moment in her mind. As she walks through the night, she tells herself that her plans to make Beryl's swordsmanship known across the kingdom have just started. She plans to build a new era where her sensei will be rightfully called a sword master. Meanwhile, the old man is in his room on his bed, exhausted from all the drinking he had during the celebration. In a library, a woman is talking to a lady known as Thistle. The woman tells her about the news that the vice commander of Liberia was defeated in a trial duel. This is the first time the woman has heard of the news, so she asks who was the man's opponent. The woman tells her that it was up against a new instructor with a nickname that has something to do with the word backwater. Thistle asks if she meant backwater swordmaster, and the woman says that it was indeed what she meant. This makes the listener realize that she is talking about Beryl, whom she reveals was also her sensei. Meanwhile, the gang are trolling the west side of the town's commercial district, where there are plenty of shops. As they sit in their carriage, Beryl asks if it is really okay for him to tag along. With full commitment, Kirani tells the man to leave all of it to her. After strolling throughout the district, the gang is ready to call it a day. Kirani asks her sensei if he has gotten used to the city. He says he seems to be getting the hang of it, but he has only been to a small portion. Hembert suggests going to all the famous spots, something that Beryl wants to try. Since Kirani is about to be on patrol on the west side anyway, she suggests that the two also come with her when she can show them around. 
She brings them to the biggest market in all of the district. There are so many shops that it overwhelms the middle-aged man. While he is overwhelmed, Kirini is all in the shopping mood, looking at clothes she can buy. Suddenly, a person in a black hood comes near Beryl and recognizes him as a sensei. He does not know who this hooded person is. All the while, the hooded person is trying to catch up with him like they are longtime friends. The sensei just cannot put a finger on who this mysterious person is. The only familiarity he recognizes is the sword they are carrying. With this single clue, he answers that she must be Fissile. The person removes her hood and reveals that the man is indeed correct. She teases her former teacher, saying that he did not recognize her and that she is sad about it. Beryl remembers her as one of his students, a quiet one at that. She rarely spoke to other children and was often practicing her swings in a corner of the dojo by herself. When she finally mastered all of his sword teachings and received her farewell sword, she was a girl with few words, saying only that she had something to do next, and then she left the dojo. At present, Kirini is inviting Fissel to go sightseeing with them. The woman takes her up on that offer since it has been a long time since she got to see her and her sensei. Kirini introduces her as the ace of the magic division. Beryl is surprised to hear that she can use magic now. He knows that the magic division is an organization composed only of skilled mages. Along with the Liberon Knights, they constitute the kingdom's mechanical power. Beryl looks at his former student, thinking he taught another amazing kid. Fissel shows him a ring in one of the shops. She says it is a magic equipment, an object imbued with magic. The ring in particular is called a candlestick ring, and it is used to give off a small flame. She then sees an earring and senses that it is cursed. Hearing this makes both Kirini and Beryl nervous. The mage offers to pay the store owner for the earrings to get rid of them, but the owner tells her she can have anything for free. Fissel comforts her nervous colleagues by saying that it is fine to carry the earrings around as long as no one wears them and the conditions to activate the curse are not met. She explains that a cursed object happens for many reasons, like if a person leaves behind their grudge or bloodthirst. Some people even make one on purpose to make mages look bad since many in the kingdom still oppose magic. Since there are many hidden dangers like curses in the city, Fissel gives Beryl a bracelet. She calls it a bracelet of rest and says that if anyone wears it while sleeping, it will make them feel well rested. As she reveals that she also has a matching pair, she tells her former sensei to spread the word that magic is great. Wearing the bracelet, Beryl is overwhelmed with joy, tearing up at the thought that his former student is such a great kid. Despite being saddened that he will no longer be seeing her swordsmanship, he is glad to see her as a great mage. Suddenly there is a scream from a distance in the street. Thieves are robbing a woman, after which they make a fast run for it. Fissel gestures to Beryl, and tells him that he does not need to do anything since she is the one who will take action. It turns out she still has a sword, and she draws it out. The middle-aged man wonders if pulling out her sword means she will not be using magic. A second after thinking this, her sword radiates lightning energy. With the trust of her sword, the lightning strikes one of the thieves, sending him flying. Beryl sees how she used the sword and now knows what kind of maid she has grown into. The other thief sees his partner down for the count, and so he quickly goes into the alley to escape. Fissel follows him with so much speed that strong winds give off from her acceleration. She keeps jumping on the walls of buildings to follow the thief. It is not long until she catches up to the thief and slices him up with a lightning imbued blade. Since both thieves are already unconscious, Kirini volunteers to take them away, effortlessly holding onto them at the same time as if they were just paper. This makes Beryl wonder if everyone in the knightly order has monstrous strength. The mage girl is mining praise from her sensei, and she asks if he saw what she did. Of course, he thought that the way she used her magic was amazing. She makes it clear that what she used was called sword spells. It is a way to strengthen the power of the blade by imbuing it with magic. Her division commander recognizes her for being the strongest to wield the art. Beryl thinks it is an incredible technique and is so amazed that his sword techniques can evolve in such a way that he wants to meet her magic teacher. Fissel says that it was the magic division commander who was the one who taught her sword spells. When she brought him up to her commander, the commander said the same thing about him. Fissel smiles, seeing that her two mentors are a lot alike. Later that night, Beryl is walking the night alone in the street. He looks at his new bracelet of rest and comments on how his shoulders have felt great ever since he had it on. He then thinks about his former students, how one has become the commander of the knightly order, and one has become an ace mage. He ponders that if his pupils got into successful careers, then maybe he has his sword techniques to thank. He stops himself from walking and slaps his face with both his hands, as if he is trying to wake himself up for being full of himself. He convinces himself that it is his pupils who deserve praise for their efforts, and that he has not accomplished anything. 
His thinking gets interrupted as he spots something strange in the distance. It is an ominous floating flame glowing in the street. As he wonders what he is looking at, the fire grows larger and larger until it takes the form of a woman made of blazing flame. With the fire being swing of her left arm, a flaming bird is formed and flies like a projectile toward the sword master. He manages to dodge the bird and, at the same time, near the distance between him and the fire being. He slices the woman's neck off, and just as he thought it was his final move, the woman's neck attaches itself to its body. Beryl looks at the situation with mere annoyance and thinks that what he is facing must be magic. Meanwhile, somewhere unseen, a shadowy figure wearing the same bracelet of rest as Beryl and Thistle is watching the sword master in secret. The battle is so intense that the street is blazed with flashing lights. Beryl slices the flame woman in two, but it just restores itself like nothing happened. He calmly assesses the situation, trying to find ways to face the fire made doll, seeing that no matter how many times he cuts it, it does no damage. Despite the stressful scene, the veteran swordsman remains expressionless, calmly observing that the demonic flame is following him. He remembers what Fissel says about magic. He is reminded that casting spells across long distances is not usually advised since it reduces the potency of the summoned magic and exhausts the mage quicker. Beryl finds himself on the town's open circle platform. He looks at his surroundings, trying to find the one that summoned the flame, thinking they would be nearby. Not long after, a footstep is heard. The enemy appears with her summoned demon flame behind her. She compliments Beryl for forcing her to reveal herself. The master swordsman looks at his opponent with confusion. He cannot believe he is looking at a child. This insults the mage, who says she is older than he is. Talking like a character from a Shakespearean play, she compliments the backwater sword master for using the right strategy of fleeing from the flame demon. She sees how he has defeated the Roaring Blade. Hearing the nickname Roaring Blade, Beryl realizes that she must be talking about Hembritz. Despite how impressed she is with his skill as a warrior, she says she has come to claim his life. The sword master tries to process her intention. While he can see that the girl is not an enemy he needs to take lightly, he thinks there is something off about what she is trying to project about herself. He stops thinking about it as he sees something horrifying. He sees that the woman is wearing the same bracelet of rest that Thistle had on her. Seeing Beryl's reaction to the bracelet, she says that she stole it a while ago from an intriguing sword-wielding mage. She shows off the bracelet with an unhinged smile, trying to provoke a reaction from the backwater swordmaster even more. Beryl's face turns serious and enraged, as he demands the lady to tell him where Fissel is. The woman says nothing and is just amused by his reactions. She summons a number of ice-made swords, all floating in the air, set to strike in Beryl's direction like he is a pincushion. As the frozen swords fly like arrows, he dodges them all. The moment the sword stops coming, a giant rock of ice drops from above. Our hero is not worried, using his sword to slice up the giant rock that he splits into two. While he is busy being distracted by the rock of ice, the mage uses it as an opportunity to shoot a blast of powerful lightning at him, crumbling the rock of ice with an explosion. She is intrigued, seeing that Beryl escaped from the attack despite her aiming at his blind spot. She is having so much fun that she laughs with joy in the face of battle. She keeps shooting a number of spells in his direction, but he keeps dodging all of them with calm precision. Beryl tries to think it over and comes to the conclusion that there is no way to get close to the enemy since there are too many spells happening all at once. He knows that if the battle lasts too long, he will get exhausted and get tossed around. On the other hand, he also knows that as long as he keeps on attacking, the mage will have no choice but to keep casting spells. While he has little experience with magic, he deduces that as long as it is within human ability, it must have a limit. He remembers Fissel's words about how long-distance magic is tiring for the user as further confirmation of that fact. Putting everything into account, he knows that whoever wins is the one who has the most energy to last. Unfortunately, the enemy has just as much of a sharp mind as he does and has already thought of the same thing. Again, he summons another spell, this time a water spirit formed like a woman, similar to its fiery counterpart. Beryl puts his guard up for the upcoming attack. The woman made of water dives to the ground, destroying itself on impact and spreading water everywhere like the waves of the sea. The area has become so hard to stand on that Beryl is struggling to stand his ground. Observing that the area around him is now filled with water, the veteran master is expecting that the enemy's next move will be a dire one. The mage does not want him to escape, so she freezes the water into ice along with his feet. While he is trapped, she absorbs her summoned spirit of flame, condensing all of its being into something so small that it fits in her palm. Looking closely, the ball of flame in her hands is so condensed that it is a shining speck. 
She throws the flaming ball into the ice. As the ball reaches the ground, she wants to see how he can escape this time around. The attack caused such a big explosion that could be seen from several houses worth of distance. The mage explains that when water enters direct contact with another matter at extremely high temperatures, it boils and instantly expands explosively, like the effects seen in volcanoes. Fitting, as she calls her attack a freatic eruption. As the heavy mist of the explosion covers the battleground, she shows regret for getting over the top, as if she did not really mean to destroy the man, but she still got caught in the heave of the moment. Alas, her attack did not work. Out of the mist, exits the backwater swordsman. He is still intact, impressively surviving with little, if any, bruises at all. Beryl looks back at the attack, and how close he was to being no longer alive if he had reacted even a tiny bit slower. To escape the explosion, he is shown cutting a huge chunky layer of the icy ground in front of him. He used his sword to lift it up, and then used the chuck of ice as a shield that protected him against the explosion. The mage smiles at how resourceful her opponent is. She slowly comes near him like a floating ghost, making him wary of an upcoming attack. With quick footing, he jumps off to another area for a dodge. He is surprised to see that the enemy did not do anything. He knows that if the enemy had kept pressure on him at his moment of rest, he would have been defeated. He wonders why she did not take advantage of the opportunity to finish things off. The woman gives off a heavy sigh, since he has now grown tired and frustrated. Since the swordsman can read anything she can cast anyway, she does not see why she needs to continue on with this little game. She tells him he is as good as Fissel makes him out to be. This makes Beryl wonder how she knows about his pupil by her name. She smiles, saying there is no reason she does not know about her since she was the one who taught her everything she knows about casting magic. She introduces herself as Lucy Diamond, a commander of the magic division. The man is startled that he is actually looking at the strongest mage in the entire kingdom. She confidently faces Beryl, and shares that she heard about him from Thistle, who said that he'd probably be able to stand against the magic commander's spells. That being said, she finds it particularly strange. Even when his life was in peril, he deliberately let himself be distracted by the flame doll. Realistically speaking, it's very unlikely for a mage to act like a common thug. Annoyed, he asks why she blatantly lied like that, and she insists that she felt the need to do so, in order to be taken seriously. Understanding her rude behavior, she apologizes and shares that she also wants to look cool in front of her student just once in a while. Just then, voices come from afar, as people rush over after hearing the commotion in the plaza. Lucy hastily calls Beryl over, urging him to run away before they get caught. He argues that she should do something about the frozen plaza first, but she assures him that water created by magic will vaporize immediately anyway. With this, the two instructors escape. The next day, Beryl makes his way through the barracks and runs into Thistle. He thanks her for the bracelet, as it's proven to be very helpful for his condition. As he asks about her day, she takes out a flask of potion. He recognizes them as the ones used by knights, and is surprised to find out that the mages are the ones making them. Looking at the heavy-looking boxes his student is carrying, he offers to help carry them. The young girl tries to refuse, saying she uses magic to carry them, but it's too late. His body shakes, and he asks for help as he realizes just how heavy the boxes are. While walking together, he shares the events of the previous night, and confirms that the little kid really is the magic division's commander. Thistle corrects him, explaining that Lucy used magic to stop her body from aging. Till now, nobody knows how old she really is. From that, they conclude that she must be older than both of them. Moreover, while she might look like a child, her title as the strongest mage in existence is undeniable. Extremely well-versed in every kind of magic on the continent, she's the very embodiment of a living magic weapon, whose usage is now supervised by the nation. Hearing this, Beryl considers himself lucky to have even survived their battle last night. The chances of meeting her again are slim, so he doesn't think about it too much. For now, he accompanies his former student up until Lucia's office. Upon reaching their destination, he's greeted by an uncanny sight. In the room, Alusha, Selena, and Lucy are gathered around the table and collectively look at him. Each of the women extends their greetings to the pair, who both tremble at the oddly powerful Lina. Beryl cautiously speaks, saying he must have come at a bad time. They say they don't mind. On the contrary, they were just speaking about him and Fissel. Lucy calls him over to sit beside her, an offer he promptly rejects. Seeing how friendly they are, his two former students get stone-faced, wondering how they're acquainted. Finally getting down to business, the old man asks what this is all about. Selena goes first, saying she has a favor to ask of him. In order to train the young adventurers, she needs his help. There's a newbie adventurer party that has recently accepted the request to conquer a dungeon. In their guild, 
Newcomers who are going on their first dungeon quest must be accompanied by an adventurer who's ranked platinum or above. Unfortunately, they don't have enough personnel, and she's the only one available for the mission. She'd be more than enough in normal cases, however, there's an unexpected variable this time. Things are still unclear, but there's a high chance that they might encounter an unknown monster. Lucy adds on, sharing that there's also a request to their magic division for further investigation. The dungeon in question is nearby, and it's said that there's a mysterious magic power seeping out of its entrance. Chances for an accidental encounter are slim, but the guild decided that at least two people should go, just in case anything happens. If he were to come with them, then there would be nothing to worry about at all. Without a moment of hesitation, he boldly accepts the request and agrees to go. He asks Alusha to keep the training ground open for a while, then returns his attention to Selena. She's helped him on multiple occasions before, but right now, he isn't sure if he could be of any use to them. Delighted by his response, the adventurer bows her head in gratitude, and they decide to meet again at the guild. They separate ways, but Lucy calls out to Thistle, inviting her to join as well. The commander believes that she might just see something amusing if she came. Meanwhile, in the corridor, Alusha expresses her surprise with her former master, certain that he would have refused the request right away. He understands her sentiments. Ever since she asked him to be the instructor of the knights, he's regained his confidence just a little bit. Hearing his sincerity flusters the young commander, and she bids her master a safe journey. Adventurers are individuals affiliated with the Adventurers Guild, whose authority transcends national borders. It's a dream job involving requests from the guild that allow you to journey across the world. Quests vary tremendously, with some asking to search for lost items, and others asking for the extermination of powerful monsters. Those who join a guild are ranked according to their strength and skills. Based on their ranking, the volume and conditions of their missions change drastically. Those of the highest rank, black, have the power to determine a nation's existence. Selena is one of those people. 20 years ago, she washed up on a riverbank, seemingly the only survivor of a monster attack. Beryl saw her there and took her in. It was understandable, but she was terrified of him at first, and she couldn't even remember her name. Then, one day, while he was training, she peeked through the ground's doors and cautiously approached. Noticing her, he offered a wooden sword, asking if she wanted to try holding it. Just then, she suddenly said that her name was Selena. The unexpected introduction caught him off guard and incited a river of tears from his eyes. Back then, she was a cute child that had to be taken care of, but things are different now. Instead of being the same scared girl, she's grown up to become a world-renowned hero. Knowing this, he can't keep asking her to take care of his lodging all the time. Landry himself was a platinum rank who seemingly did well for himself during this time. After a while of contemplating and walking, the master and his pupils finally reach the guild and are greeted by a pair of men. An older-looking man with a scar across his eye introduces himself as Nidas, the Liberio branch guildmaster. Beside him is Majin, the guildmaster's aide. The younger man stares intently at Beryl, who's reminded of a familiar shark gaze, particularly from his energetic student. After hearing from Lucy and Selena, the pair have already been informed of their intention to help. With his usual timid attitude, the swordsman confirms his purpose. Given the people who recommended him, Nidas already finds his presence reassuring. However, Majin joins the conversation. Despite the credible recommendations, he expresses his reluctance and states that he's against letting an outsider join them in their dungeon expedition. Selena begins to get hostile, thinking that the aide distrusts her teacher. But this is not the case. His concern is the risk of Beryl getting injured or losing his life. The Adventurer's Guild is built on trust. If a rumor about the guild allowing a civilian to enter the dungeon to die were to spread despite its legitimacy, then the people would lose their trust in the guild. While it might be rude of him, Majin asks the swordsman if he has any experience exploring dungeons. He shares that he has explored alone once, giving the others a spark of hope. The aide asks how it went, and he reveals that, without defeating a single monster, he ran for the entrance with his tail between his legs. His confidence crumbles, more so as he admits that he's been too scared to try again. If that's the case, then he's at the same level as a newbie, leaving them in doubt about handing him the responsibility to take care of their aspiring adventurer's lives. Selena insists that her master is not someone who would die so easily. On the other hand, Majin argues that her claim is not something they can determine so easily. As Beryl is distraught over being fought over, Lucy cuts through the conversation. Concluding things concisely, she says that if the man in question were to display power on par with a platinum rank, then their doubts would be put to rest. Moreover, if he was on par with a black rank, then their complaints should disappear completely. 
the two younger men are confused, but the guild master understands immediately. In a twisted turn of events, Beryl suddenly found himself face to face with Selena. A crowd roars around them, already betting on who'll win the impromptu duel. As the announcer introduces them as the twin blade dragon and a mysterious old man, the old man gathers his frustration against Lucy, who slyly suggested the entire thing on her own. The proposition convinced the guilt members, but now he's stuck in a duel he didn't even want. On the other hand, Selena has her sword at the ready, excited to have the opportunity to go against her teacher. With prepared seats right in the front row, Fissel lays down some beverages for the group and asks her commander if this was the amusing sight she was talking about. With her arms outstretched in delight, Lucy confirms her guess. Hearing this, Majin asks her if she meant for this to happen, right from the beginning. Pretending to be oblivious, she insists that there's no way for her to know such things. Nidus simply laughs, saying there's no winning against her. The aide doesn't really mind, as he only wanted to measure the night instructor's strength. That being said, he wonders how the old man would fare against a renowned black rank. The highest an adventurer can attain is an ocean rank. Such words are something Selina has heard before. Many join the guild with blazing ambition in their hearts. However, not one of them aimed to be a black rank, because to be a black rank is to surrender one's humanity. Some are asking him to win, while others are asking him to take care of his body. Annoyed, Beryl tries to calm himself down enough to concentrate on the task at hand. He thinks about his other pupils. Kirani just went outside the city, and Alusha was often too busy to come to sword practice. All things considered, there's no mistaking it at all. Compared to anyone he's ever sparred with, Selena is on an entirely different level, with a presence that's completely overwhelming. The match begins, and her feet are immediately off the ground. She closes the gap between them in an instant, and lets out a diagonal slash from below. His student is extremely fast, but his eyes can still see, so his body is able to react accordingly. He seamlessly dodges each and every one of her strikes, no matter how unending they might seem to be. By watching her movements and posture closely, he figures out the next moves she'll use. A few feints make their way through, but his eyes see all of them clearly. Although he's dodged and parried all of her attacks so far, the barrage just doesn't stop. Looking on, Lucy points out that the black rank adventurer is as fierce as ever, and Nidas is pleased that the fight is tougher than he expected it to be. Meanwhile, Majin studies them closely. He's well aware that Selina is not just a mere dual sword wielder. A few years ago, a dragon appeared on the west side of Liberio. Since the knights were too far away, the guild had to declare an emergency extermination quest for all available adventurers in the vicinity. To their surprise, the dragon had regenerative abilities, allowing it to recover from even the most fatal injuries. It was a new species that they would later classify as the immortal dragon. None of the ocean rankers were able to take it down, and the collateral damage was thought to be widespread. The one who put an end to the deadlock was Selina, who was a platinum rank at the time. With unfathomable speed and power, she drove her blades into the beast and wounded it beyond its regenerative power. Until it was weakened from the blood loss, she never stopped. She proved then that her greatest weapon wasn't her strength, but her peerless endurance. Selina came from behind and slashed an attack at Beryl, who immediately dodged it. Her pace increased with each slash, and the only thing he could do was repel them. Selina reflected on how amazing her master is, the only thing she wants is for him not to lose to her. She wishes her teacher will always stay ahead. As she performs another slash, Beryl swiftly blocks her. He disarms one of her sword, making the onlooker shock. Beryl goes for another slash, and Selina counters with another blade. Instead, Beryl blocks it and grabs the other sword, which was sent flying before. He used it to deal the final blow, ensuring his victory. Beryl is proud of her. She has become so strong. 